Check, check, one, two. All right. What about now? Are we on? Man, it's hard to know. Okay, well, I don't know if we're on right now. Uh, let's see if it comes back to life. It just kind of, the picture's like frozen. And I'm thinking, hmm, am I on or am I not on? <laughs> okay, okay, looks like we're back on. Thanks, guys. That was kind of weird. But hey, technology's weird. So what? Yeah. Well, welcome back, and thanks for uh, thanks for joining me here. It's uh, it's nice to see you all in the chat, anyway. Um, and it's great to be back from the. UKED's gathering, which was just this past weekend. Wow. I mean, <clears throat> what a time. For those of you who were there, thanks for being there. It was like sort of a a bubble of good vibes and community music and just unforgettable experiences. So. And of course, uh, for those of you who don't know what UKED's is, it's our worldwide uh, ukulele band uh, that's has played with me on my latest album, which is now in hand and ready to go. We're not going to release it till um, February, but we're still celebrating. So thanks to all the UKEDs um, who have showed up today, but especially those who uh, came to the gathering and all those who played on the album. What an experience. Uh, really humbling, and I just thank you all. It's the gathering, which was our first time really together in person, is just sort of replaying in my mind over and over like a like a sweet dream so it's nice nice memories to hold on to so um today i'm jumping back into eutropolis and um looking at some student comments and a couple came up here that i wanted to highlight and then, you know, I was thinking maybe we could just do a little uh, a Q&A. So um, anytime, just feel free to, to drop a question in the chat and I'll see if I can get to it. Be great to know what you guys are really, really thinking about and um, what you're playing right now, what you want to be playing, where your ukulele journey is at right at this moment. Because, uh, you know... Um, things change. We all grow and, and develop in our own ways. We discover new paths and, um, you know, Eutropolis has always tried to cover the, the bases, you know, from beginner to intermediate, uh, advanced and even sort of extreme <laughs> courses. But, um, you know, everybody changes and, uh, I'm really, curious to know where you guys are at in your own journeys and, and what it is that you're looking for in the in the coming months and, and years. You know, what are your ambitions for your own playing? I'm really, really curious about that right now. So um, please help me out to better understand where you're at by dropping a comment in the chat. And maybe we can talk about where you want to go and uh, how I might be able to help. Uh, get you there, or how we might get there together, whether that's teaching or playing or both. Um, let's help each other. So let me know uh, where you're at musically. I'm really curious about that. Okay, so the first comment, uh, or at least the first the first question I have here is from um, Carol. And Carol is working on the Americana Ukulele course. 
And uh, she's working on lesson number one, which is an introduction to Travis Picking. Now, oh my goodness. If you haven't discovered the the magic and mystery of Travis Picking, uh, now's the time. Travis Picking is where you keep your... your uh, you're picking thumb going back and forth between the two strings that are closest to your face. And, you know, for me, I'm using the high G, so that means I'm starting on the third string, the C, and then going to the G. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now, if I was playing a guitar, I would probably start on the outer string, on the on the on the lowest string. And if I was playing the low G ukulele, it would probably sound best if I started on the the outer string. So I get the um pa um pa, where the um of the um pa is the lower of the two notes. But because I'm using high G, and because this is actually the way I I learned uh, Travis picking. I always start on the C string, the third string, and move outward to the fourth string. It'll feel backwards if you've learned this on guitar, but uh, I think it sounds best that way. That's sort of the engine that drives the rhythm. And then over top of that, sails the melody. That's the basic idea that you keep one thing going continuously and then add another thing independently over top. It's kind of like having a left hand and a right hand on the piano where your thumb, in this case, is playing the role of the left hand of the piano and your fingers are playing the role of the right hand of the piano. And it gets really fun when you start to syncopate the melody over top of that accompaniment. So you start dropping notes in between those thumb notes, like... That's where it really starts to take off. And remember, syncopation is just a fancy word that means accenting a beat that is not normally accented, or even playing on a beat that is not normally played on. This thumb is right now giving you the beats that we normally play on. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. But if I throw a note in between, that's, by definition, a syncopation because it's on one of the beats that we don't normally play on. It's not where you would tap your foot. Syncopation is all about playing on the beats where you don't normally tap your foot. That's all syncopation means. And so this creates a beautiful framework for self-accompaniment. And that's what this uh, lesson one in Americana Ukulele is all about. So that's where Carol is, and she's saying, um, I really am having trouble knowing which finger to use on my fretting hand. They all seem to get tangled up, and I can't keep the chord shapes um, straight and use the fingers, and keep the thumb moving all at the same time. It just does not feel smooth at all. Do you have any tips? Well... I think the tune that uh, Carol is working on is, um, uh, no, that's I Saw the Light. That one I arranged in a Travis Picking style for uh, Duets for One. I think she is working on Lonesome Valley.
Very fun. But as Carol's saying, it can tie you in knots. It doesn't feel smooth at first. Any tips? So I said to, to Carol, the thing about Travis picking is that it is so physical, right? This is a physical skill. It's not a concept. Well, okay, it's a concept, but you can get the concept very quickly. It's like, okay, the thumb goes even, Steven, all the way, never skips a beat, and the fingers go over top in a more free and syncopated style. Great. Tick that box. I understand the concept. But there's a big difference between understanding the concept and being able to do the physical skill. We all know that, you know. I understand the concept of running the 100-meter dash. You know, it's like, uh, I wait for the gun to go, and when the gun goes, I run as fast as I can to the other end. I get the concept. The concept is very easy to grasp. But actually doing it, and doing it well, uh, you know, it takes a lifetime. And for somebody like me, eh, you know, more than a lifetime. It's the same thing with Travis picking. Um, so, you know, I just reassured Carol and I reassure anyone who's working on a very physical skill. Um, it's like um, yoga or high jump or uh, using chopsticks. <laughs> you know, it really just takes time and consistent effort. I think it'll take at least six weeks for Carol to uh, see much progress on this. It's six weeks for your fingers to learn a new routine. So the key is to come back to it often, not to overdo it, and above all, to be patient. I know this is not like a rocket science, but sometimes you just have to be assured that it's okay, that it's not coming immediately, that it doesn't feel with that same kind of instant gratification that you got when you first played a C chord. And you thought, wow, I couldn't do that one minute ago. And now I'm a musician. You know, that is the, the beauty of the ukulele. You know, the accessibility of this instrument draws us in and makes us feel welcome. And I love the ukulele for that. We all love the ukulele for that. But when you start to ask more of the ukulele and you start to ask more of yourself, and you start to push into more intermediate and advanced territory, well, you're also going to have to crank up the patience. <laughs> the patience factor is going to have to get cranked up because the distance from your brain to your fingers is way further than you think. Or maybe you think it is a long way. Maybe you know this is a long way. But maybe you just need somebody like me or a friend or a family member to just give you permission to say, it just takes a really long time to get a concept from your brain into the tips of your fingers. I mean, we're talking about, you know, a very short distance physically, but a very long distance in terms of habit forming and muscle memory. So all that to say, Carol, you're on the right path. Keep at it just a little bit every day. Make sure you rest in between practice sessions and let the sound of this Travis picking guide you. If you fall in love with this sound, you will find your way to it. If you fall in love with the sound, you will find your way there. I think that's, for me, always been the guiding principle. I will find the motivation if I fall in love with the sound. Otherwise, I'm going to be trying to do it because I think I should do it or because somebody else wants me to do it. Those are reasons that are somewhat somebody else's reasons. Those are not my reasons. If I can't find my own reasons for it, it's really going to be hard for me to get there. And if I do get there, it'll be sort of under duress. It won't be under my own power, you know? For me, it always comes back to the music. You know, it's one of my 
faults in a way that I believe so strongly in the music and that everything comes from the music. Because of course, not everything comes from the music. <laughs> you know, you, you, you hear, I, I come across art, artists all the time who I think, wow, if they were judged in the, you know, in the court of popular opinion based just on their music, these guys would be like the most famous band in the world. Um, it's about so much more than the music. And yet I can't help but fall into my old habits and believe that it all comes from the music, that it all stems from the music. And when it comes to learning, I think, you know, motivation is, is something that is connected to your obsession and love for a particular sound. So Carol, if you find yourself waking up in the morning, first thing, and thinking about that sound, if you find yourself uh, going back to this again and again, and you just think, I can't live without that sound. I can't live without knowing that I could play the uh, accompaniment to a syncopated melody because I want to be able to go camping and sit in my chair and sit around a campfire, and I want to be able to take my ukulele up onto the uh, to a mountain, you know, range onto a onto a ridge overlooking some valley, and I want to be able to sit there and be my own accompanist and hear the syncopation against the accompaniment. I want that freedom. I want that sound. Well, then, you will find it. You'll find the motivation. Uh, but above all, be patient and be consistent with it. It's what we all have to do. Give it at least six weeks before you even give a thought to how much progress you're making. Carol, I wish you all the best with this and you con. So that's Carol and she's working on Travis picking one of my favorites and as part of the Americana ukulele course. Uh, but you know, we all have those moments where we're uh, struggling to make a, a new technique work for us. Just this weekend, I was uh, sitting there with um, Daniel Ward, and he was showing me some of the uh, flamenco techniques that he uses. Well, jeepers. It's going to be a long six weeks until my fingers do some of those things. But it was so cool to get a look behind the scenes and see how those, uh, how those rudiments work in flamenco. Totally new um, world for me. So we, we are all doing this all the time. You're not alone. <laughs> and uh, sometimes that's good to know. Let's go now to another tune in the Americana course. This one is um, Angeline the Baker. Angeline the Baker is one of the most played uh, old-time tunes. It works beautifully for claw hammer, and claw hammer is that old-time style of banjo playing. Uh, not the new... Quicksilver bluegrass kind of uh, three finger Earl Scrugg style, but the very sort of ancient, um, more modal and drony kind of almost meditative style of banjo. <laughs> This is a style I have loved for many, many years. Um, I find similar to Travis Picking that it gets me in a zone. It gets me in kind of a mood. And, uh, and uh, even though it's uh, very rhythmic and kind of gets you, into a, um, uh, got, gets you into a groove, it's also very melodic. And I think that's what this question from Scott is, is about. Scott says... Uh, hi, James. Very nice claw hammer arrangement of this tune. Uh, Scott's actually done a really nice arrangement himself, so he knows the tune really well. I had a listen. It's really cool. Um, he said, this track is a is an endless source of inspiration, and I agree. Some, some songs are like that, right? You just keep going back to the well, and you learn something new every time you play the song. Angeline the Baker is one of those pieces, for me at least, and it sounds like it is for Scott as well. Uh, he says, there are a lot of chords. There's sort of a drone on the C string. 
But in your version, um, in measures five and seven, he says, you go for um, one of the notes on the fourth string. I'll play you that section now so you know what Scott's talking about. Here it is again. Right there, I'm just going to like freeze frame right there. Instead of playing those notes in a row on a single string, I'm reaching over to the fourth string so that if you listen closely, you can hear those two ringing at the same time. Now that's something I'm borrowing from uh, the great John King, who inspired many, many players to explore this idea of campanella style, which is, um, campanella means um, little bells in Italian. So it's a style where you're using the high fourth string to create um, harp-like passages where each note in a melody is played on a different string so that they can bleed into one another, so they can ring over each other, just like little church bells, like that. And I'm borrowing a little bit of that in this section of um, Angeline the Baker. It goes by really fast, so you don't really hear it as so much bell-like, but it gives a nice little pop to that, um, that passing note. As opposed to... We're not hammering it down on a single string. That way, really punches out each of the notes. And Scott's looking at this arrangement and saying, I, I don't really understand your interpretation, he says. Uh, this, this is, it's hard not to cut out the, the C string drone when you do that by accident, which he really likes, and so do I. He said it's hard not to cut that out, and it creates a sort of a void in that moment because the drone suddenly disappears. So what do you do? Do you play that fourth string note in such a way as to leave that C string ringing? Or do you muffle this string throughout the piece? Uh, he's just not sure what's more important, the continuation of the drone or the punchiness of that campanella moment. So... Sure, we're looking at this arrangement through a microscope right now. But um, it's an interesting question about a really interesting piece that continues to uh, inspire generations of players. Now, this piece only has two chords in it, C and F. That's it, in the whole piece. And yet this two-chord song, Angeline the Baker, continues to give and give and give. So that's kind of interesting. Those are the great songs, aren't they? The, the ones that can withstand so much twisting and turning and scrutiny. You put them under a microscope and you just see more and more and more inside great melodies, great tunes like this. I guess what I would say, Scott, is that, um, first of all, thanks for the kind words about the arrangement. I'm glad you like it. Um, when I go for those G string notes... I do momentarily sh uh, muffle the C string, and I don't really mind that. I think it gives a little lift to the music um, that I find is kind of rhythmic and, and refreshing. So here's what I mean. Do you hear how the C string drone kind of drops out for a second? I kind of find that that nice, you know. I think it it almost like highlights the melody, uh, rather than feeling like the bottom drops out. I just kind of feel like it it, it lets the melody shine through just for a moment, um, like um, when you're uh, when, when you're skateboarding and you're going along and you hear the you hear the uh, the, the 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 sound of the uh, of the wheels on the ground sort of grinding. <laughs> and then there's a jump, and you hear just silence for a moment. And then the trucks go back down. 
you know, I've always loved that kind of like continuous sound and then a sudden interruption and then right back into the sound. It almost feels like a like a jump and then a falling back into the groove. And I guess what I'm saying to Scott is that it's really kind of a matter of interpretation. It's a matter of opinion. Like he uh, is sitting there going, yeah, but the drone drops out and I really love the drone. And I'm going, yeah, but listen, the drone drops out. Isn't that cool? You know, um, all that to say that there's a lot of leeway in these kind of arrangements for your own interpretation. And what I love about what Scott has posted here on this on this uh, comment is that he's got his own arrangement. And uh, I'll link that in the, the show notes uh, when we're done so you can check out his arrangement. Um, he's coming to it with a, a really good understanding of the tune and asking a really detailed question, um, which really made me think about what was more important to me, like the momentum of that drone or the slight lift that I'm getting when I mute that drone. Uh, it doesn't change the arrangement at all. It just changes your perception of the music as you're hearing it. And um, that was really interesting to me. And Scott, I really appreciate the, um, the comments, the question, and the arrangement that you have done. So thanks so much. For those of you who haven't uh, explored Clawhammer, it's another one of these extremely physical um, techniques that is very simple in concept, but can take a long time to internalize. But I highly recommend it. There's lots of resources out there. Um, Lil Rev, Aaron Keim, uh, Kathy Fink. Uh, lots of people have put together really great claw hammer resources that you can find on um, YouTube and elsewhere. Of course, um, there's there's lessons on claw hammer in the Americana ukulele course from me. Um, it's something that really changed my life. It's a technique that uh, I can't imagine, you know, living without. I often just pick up my ukulele and um, when I'm playing for myself, when I'm not playing for an audience, I'm not trying to impress anybody or, you know, make money. I often find myself drifting back into claw hammer because it's so meditative and uh, once you get the hang of it it's it's, it's effortless and the, the melodies just sort of tumble out of the ukulele That's a version of uh, Johnson Boys that I learned from Jerry Canote, another wonderful claw hammer player. So if you're looking ahead in your own ukulele journey and you're wondering, hmm, where should I go next? And you haven't yet explored claw hammer, I highly recommend it. It might change your life the way it did mine. So good luck. And uh, Scott, thanks for the question. Hope that helps. Okay, I think uh, I've got one more short one here. Let me see. Uh, and then I'll uh, then I'll get into some comments and uh, questions here. I hope we have some I hope we have some questions um, or uh, thoughts about where you're going next. The last question here uh, for this session, this question comes from Marie, and Marie is working on um, 
Bella Boca Polka, <laughs> which is uh, actually a tune that she's learning how to teach as part of the Jehui teacher certification program. So it's using the flat pick and we're starting to edge toward tremolo with students by doing that repeated, that repeated note. That one right there. Students are learning how to play both in a downward direction and an upward direction with the little piece of plastic that we call the flat pick. And that flat pick gives them so much agility uh, that they didn't have before. Because the flat pick sounds pretty much the same on the way down as it does on the way up. And for years and years, the flat pick has been used by, um, especially by Canadian ukulele ensembles like the, the Halifax A Group or the Langley Ukulele Ensemble to play these sort of agile melodic passages, but also to play tremolo. So it can, it can be very rhythmic, but it can also be quite lyrical. And Marie is, um, is getting into this, uh, getting into how to teach this technique. And she says, I've always flat picked on my guitar with my pinky finger anchored just below the strings on the actual soundboard. She said, it helps me to find the right string at the right time. Is there anything wrong with doing it this way? She said, I'm much more likely to hit the wrong string without that pinky finger anchor. But perhaps it's just that I'm so used to anchoring with my pinky. So she says, you know, what do you think about anchoring like that? Now, this is really common. Uh, and, and I'm sure some of you listening here today are thinking, yeah, that's, that's what I do too. I use the pinky finger on my plucking hand to touch, touch down on the soundboard. And that helps me to know where I am in space, right? And uh, is there anything wrong with that? Well, um, I'm going to say, I'm going to go out on a limb here because I know this is a bit of a controversial question for those of us who really like to nerd out on this stuff. I'm going to say there's nothing really wrong with anchoring the pinky if it works for you. And if you've been doing it for like 30 or 40 years, you know, um, I, I'm not sure that I would change it now if it's really working for you. I'm not sure that I would recommend that for a beginner because I do think it, it hinders the, the range of motion a little bit. And it also can dampen the sound slightly because you're pressing onto the sound board. But here's what I will say. I, I agree with Marie in, in one way, and that's I think everyone anchors in some way. I, I think it's pretty hard to play with the flat pick just like floating in space not connected to anything at all but i've always felt that the the forearm touching on the sort of the edge or the the bout of the ukulele is the anchor that that i need um a second anchor with the pinky finger is to me actually kind of limiting it 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 means that I'm touching in two places, the forearm that's, that's draped over the, the side of the ukulele and the pinky finger. I find that that's just like, I don't know. It's like, you know, I feel like I'm anchored in two places, which I don't really need to be, you know, how many anchors does a ship need, um, to make sure it doesn't, you know, blow away in the night. Um, one good anchor is probably enough. I do believe there has to be some point of contact other than the pick itself, because that would be just kind of weird. Um, but the forearm touching that bout, at least for me, it gives me enough contact to feel secure. Without sort of limiting the range of motion in the way that the pinky anchor can. So if you're teaching this, I recommend uh, encouraging students to drape their arm over the ukulele, feel that 
edge, that bout of the of the instrument against their forearm, but keep the fingers tucked away in sort of a, uh, not a fist, just sort of, you know, move them out of the way. Uh, they don't have to be clenched, but um, having the, the, the fingers into the palm. That is, is sort of a, a good default. Now, I will say I'm kind of dancing around this a little bit because um, when I look at my own playing, and I'm really honest with myself, like, am I doing anything else or am I strictly going by the book? I have to be honest, like, I'm, I'm also, um, I also feel the need, like Marie, to sort of uh, feel where I am in space. And so I will often not anchor, but I'll often sort of let my pinky finger uh, sort of just touch the, the um, just graze along. So it's actually, sometimes it's actually slightly scraping. Uh, not with the nail, but like the side of the, uh, uh, of the finger. It's actually sort of rubbing on the, on the soundboard. And you can't see that. It's just one of these like backstage things that's happening because, you know, you can't see behind my uh, hand as I'm playing. But if I'm really honest about what's actually going on back there, that, that side of my pinky is kind of, is just touching down enough to sort of feel just a feather touch where that soundboard is. I, I'm not sure if I've ever really admitted that in public before. Ooh. Um, but, you know, I'm stopping short of like pressing down and, and staying anchored there. But, you know, to be honest, I'm still touching, uh, almost just like caressing the, um, the soundboard without actually getting locked in one place. So maybe there is, you know, kind of a, a happy medium between what you would say is a, like a textbook, you know, anchorless technique for the flat pick and the other extreme, which is to pin yourself down in one place and potentially um, affect the sound and the range of motion. So that's kind of a, you know, answer that tries to thread the needle, but I wanted to be honest with, uh, with Marie and with you guys about what's actually going on behind the, behind the scenes, uh, at least when I'm flat picking. And, and I'd be really curious to hear about others who uh, have opinions about that. So Marie, thank you for the question. Uh, as much as that might not be a very clear answer, I hope that gives you uh, some insight into what works for me and uh, some ideas to try with your students. Thanks, Marie. Okay, so I'm going to go now to uh, a few questions. Hopefully we have um, a few here in the chat. And I'm just going to randomly go through here and see what I get. Uh, okay, <laughs> this is where I was asking about, you know, what's next for you and what are you excited about and what are you uh, anxious to get into with your ukulele playing? Johanna says, I'm currently grinding through the jazz course and the ukulele way. I love that. Grinding it through it. Um, that's what it takes. A little bit of ukulele grind. Um, Michael says, I'm enjoying playing melody in the background as the rest of the group strums and chords along. That's cool. So Michael's getting into improvisation and playing solos. Love it. Um... Leslie saying, I'd love to find others to play ensemble pieces with rather than just strum and sing. That is very cool. Um, I, I hear you. You know, um, a few years ago, I was threatening to publish a book called Classical Ukulele that was arranged for um, uh, a bunch of wonderful classical pieces arranged in four parts based on the original scores that I was able to find online. And uh, I still haven't published it. And if you were listening to last season, you might understand why, because there was sort of like a, there was a catch-22 about how to tune the baritone and how to notate the baritone. So I think we're making some progress on that. And uh, shout out to uh, Barry and also Larry, uh, two uh, friends in the ukulele world who are um, very into technical stuff. And, and we had some good conversations over email about um, 
how that might work. Um, and hopefully we'll be getting that book out before too long. So you can um, have some more arrangements that are that are for ukulele orchestra uh, rather than just a ukulele jam session, both of which I love, but they're very different, aren't they? Um, Ray is saying, I'm working through the ukulele way. I want to get to further lessons and then uh, and then run into a monster chord four-finger bar. Uh, <laughs> he's saying, those are the kind of chords that just stop me cold. Uh, yeah. Any suggestions for these monster chords that stop me cold? Hmm. I, I imagine, like, when you think about a monster chord, I uh, I think of this this kind of shape here, where it's like three five three five. I love that chord, but it is a bit of a monster. Um, one thing, one thing that uh, often helps when you're when you're working on like monster chords that you're really having a tough time with, is um, the angle of your forearm, your left forearm, or at least your fretting uh, forearm. Here's the thing that beginners often get wrong, because we often lead them astray, you know, when they're first starting out. Um, beginners often think that your fingers should be parallel to the frets. Because, I don't know, just kind of makes sense, right? You're, the The frets look like they're about the width of a finger and well they see people playing bar chords so they think oh well i should keep my hands so that my fingers are running perfectly parallel to those fret wires and that is a trap that's a trap because if you need to do any sort of stretching to reach any notes you will have to separate your fingers like dr spock like that's the only way if your fingers are parallel to the frets it's the only way to get you know reach larger distances you have to separate like the vulcan salute you know live long and prosper that's the only way to do it but and and of course that's kind of uncomfortable for most people including me and i'm a big star trek fan but you know that's uncomfortable for me on the on the fretboard so instead instead of separating the fingers if you if you um pivot your forearm so that your the tips of your fingers are actually pointing across to the opposite shoulder. This is just a, a slight pivot of the arm. That means that a lot of these um, stretches that had been really awkward don't become so much separations of the fingers as they become just reaching of the fingers, but not really much distance between them. So this 3-5-3-5 three, five, three, five chord, which we might call... B flat six. Now with just that slight change in the angle of my forearm becomes much less uncomfortable. And I know this is hard to see and it's hard to make any sense of when you're just listening. But the point I want to make is that sometimes when you are struggling with a particular chord position, it's the angle uh, of the arm that can make or break it. So if nothing else, if you're struggling with a chord or a chord shape, move your uh, elbow and arm around. It, it's almost like a photographer, you know, moving the light to try to find just the right angle on the subject. If you move that elbow out and in and let the forearm explore different, uh, different angles, you might find that some of these chords that were really tripping you up actually become a lot more doable. So Ray, I hope that helps. <clears throat> Thanks for the question. All right. Let's keep looking here. Maybe one more before we uh, before we call it a day. Let's see. Um, Rachel says, I feel like I'm starting from the very beginning. I've played for four years, but my understanding of what makes music music and why things sound the way they do is very kindergarten. Hmm. Well, first of all, thanks for 
your honesty, Rachel, you know, I think you're saying what a lot of people are thinking, which is, you know, how do I get, how do I get where I want to be? Um, I feel that every day when, when I listen to music that I love, I feel like, how am I going to get there? Do I even belong there? Is there even a path for me? You know, if I'm listening to a, a great songwriter, if I'm listening to uh, Leonard Cohen or John Prine, I think, is there even a path for me to get close to that place? If I'm listening to uh, a great band like uh, like uh, Nowhere, I've been really into lately, this sort of California funk band, just like, these guys are just outrageous. You know, they're so good. Uh, or, you know, listen to Oscar Peterson, you think, my goodness, like, are these people from a different planet? You know, am I even living on the same planet as some of these musicians? It's kind of, it's kind of hard to accept, isn't it? Like that there's a very good chance you'll, you'll never get to where you want to be. And I think that's where we all need to embrace our sort of artist identities and consider ourselves all artists on on the path together. I think artists are all bound together by a common understanding. And what I mean is when I meet an artist, when I meet an artist, I, I sort of look them in the eye and I feel instantly connected to them because of one thing because I know that they are trying to make something beautiful and mostly failing. That's the commonality that we have. I know that about them. And I feel like we are connected through that experience. If you think of yourself as a student, students are always kind of like, well, what, what grade did you get? You know, did you get 90% or 70% or did you get a C or a D? Like students are always kind of comparing themselves to each other and each other to an external sort of metric. How far did I get? How fast did I go? Did I go there faster than you? Did I go further than you? That to me has always been a much more difficult place to be and to grow. So if you think of yourself as an artist who's on the path with all the other artists, really struggling in good faith to make something beautiful and mostly failing and realizing that uh, your fellow artists are experiencing that same thing. Somehow you get outside of the system of sort of assessment that we often, most of us at least, grew up in into a sort of a, a world of incomparability where everybody's doing their thing and walking their own path. Maybe that sounds kind of unsatisfying if you really like to know where you are and exactly where you're going. But to me, it's, uh, it's more liberating. Might not be as satisfying because you don't know always where you are exactly, but it's more liberating. And it connects you to other people who are walking the path with you. So that might be an awfully philosophical thing to say. But uh, Rachel, that's, that's how I feel. And I appreciate you sharing how you feel. And I hope that helps a little bit. Well, Susanna is, saying, is seconding that. There's no success without the lessons from failure. And uh, Chantel says, Comparison is the thief of joy. What a, uh, what a beautiful quote. Depressing, but also so true. Comparison is the thief of joy. Ryan says, We are all on the path. And what a nice way to, uh, to finish this session. I really appreciate you guys tuning in. As always, um, we'll be turning some of this discussion, at least into podcasts over the next month. Um, I look forward to seeing you on Uctropolis, uh, in any of the courses. Also, we have, uh, Uko Loudly, which is just gearing up. We just finished recording our very first song. Uko Loudly is, um, another global ukulele band that anybody can participate in, uh, jump in on, contribute a track. It's completely free. Go to ukuloudly.com and join the band. We will have our second tune coming up in the next uh, few weeks. So um, I look forward to seeing you there. And uh, thanks again to everybody for showing up today. And uh, I wish you all the best. Keep on strumming. I'll talk to you soon.
Bye for now.